Welcome to Governance Minutes, brought to you by the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals and Knowledge Partner Host, Corporate Board Member, along with contributor Thomson Reuters. Welcome to Governance Minutes. I'm Darla Stuckey, and with me today is Matt Lepore, Corporate Secretary and Chief Governance Counsel at Pfizer. Um, we are going to talk about annual meetings 2013 today, and we are happy to have Matt here, who's just off of his successful completion of his annual meeting last week. So, Matt, how do you feel today? I feel relieved. I feel, um, I feel happy to be done with the process. It's a, it's a lot of work, as you know, um, as anybody who's watching this knows, um, and it's always a great feeling when you're finished. Right. We're going to talk a little bit about the process, sort of t when it starts, how you get it done, a little bit about shareholder engagement with your shareholders this year, what you found, and then get to the actual meeting and talk okay. a little bit about the prep of the annual, you know, the prep, the, what the corporate secretary does to prep for the meeting and prepping the executives. Um, so first, let me ask you, so when did you start the process for the 2013 annual meeting? We start the process for an annual meeting almost immediately after the previous meeting. So, you know, this week actually I have a meeting scheduled with many members of my team to go over what we just did last week and to try to come up with ways we can improve and while well, everything's fresh, it's a right. good time to do it. So right. for this one that we just finished, we met, we would have met May of last year and we would have started that process very generally around that time but you know really after the summer it starts to really heat up okay. and we have a checklist um, that has every conceivable issue related to an annual meeting and you'd love to share a sample of that with with me and for the society website I'm sure would love to do that. that's <laughs> fine it, it really it's I don't know how many pages it's probably 60 pages long and it has everything we do and okay. we have you know, it has a, like a heat map on it so we can see when it's almost done, when it's done, we oh, can wow. track it. Yeah. And the team gets together every few weeks in the beginning and then when we get to the new year, we start to go weekly, you know, a couple times a week to make sure and we're getting everything done. And just to be very clear, when you say, when did I start working? I mean, the Pfizer team, right? all of my guys but how many? So how team, many roughly ballpark people is that and where are they from? I'm sure they're from cross cross. I would say the whole governance team, which is my group, is involved in some way in the annual meeting. Everyone, um, and we have many different functions on my team. So you know that just shows the the breadth of what happens at an annual meeting. You know, everyone from the disclosure lawyers to the people who are responsible for the board. Um, board are, logistics. The, logistics. And, they're yeah. all involved. Security. Security is, is in compliance, and they're involved. As is compliance more generally. Right. Um, corporate communications are heavily involved. I actually uh, at Pfizer. I partner um, with somebody who reports up into our head of communications. Um, her name is Liz Golden, and the two of us really co-manage the process leading to the annual meeting. Um, and then executive comp is obviously right. very involved. Right. And okay. audit. I mean, there, it, audit. it's a right. huge Everything. Right. team right. of right. people, media. Okay. We'll get to the materials later because I know part of the prep is the materials. Right. I don't want to go too far into this without <clears throat> getting to some of the good stuff. So you start in September, you don't go in earnest until probably January, but in December, the late fall time frame is when you're getting shareholder proposals. So tell me what kind of proposals you got this year and sort of what you did. We start the getting them, sometimes we'll get them early in the summer. You know, we'll start getting them June, July, August. Um, we, we really will get them in October, November, and then right, you know, I guess the deadline closes sometime in December. Um, this year we got six shareholder proposals. Last year we had 12. Um, of the 12 last year, probably five of them were related to Citizens United and political contributions. This year we had, I think, one related to that. So you could see it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's changed. The direction of that, that issue one, seems right. to be... That's you know, interesting. Yeah. But that, and that one did not make it into your proxy. That one did not make it into our proxy. We, we were able to exclude that one seeking no action because of uh, because it was similar to one that received low votes in a previous oh, year. Okay. Um, okay. I think that was that. There were several. Um, we, we filed no action on almost all of them this year. Um, we, I think, 
excluded three of them on no action. We negotiated one of them and two were in. Okay. And of the two that were I in. I might be completely wrong about what I just said. But okay. That's my, that's <laughs> we'll my recollection okay. of, of <laughs> that's exactly fine. how it went. We'll check you. Of the two that were in, I think you, the most interesting one, maybe because it was a very close vote, was the proposal on written consent. Right. And tell me what happened when you went to engage with institutions on that proposal. Written consent was, um, was an interesting one for us because last year the vote on that was very close. So in the 2012 annual meeting, it was um, 49 point something to 50 against, you know, 51 point. It was very, very close. And so that suggested, obviously, that we have a, it was a, a, a very um, even. Right. There's half your shareholders want it and half don't. What was, but the, that's, what was see, the threshold percent? That's, but that's not exactly true because, okay. you know, and this is where, so, so the issue with that is, I mean, I, I do believe half of them, half of them appear to be, to, to do not think that Pfizer needs this. Mm -hmm. There's this other half that is, was voting for it, and I wanted to really understand, at least as for most of them, what it was they were voting for because I was concerned that we do have a huge amount of vote at Pfizer that's automatically voted with, you know, wh whatever the proxy, proxy advisor right. firms, yeah. Um, I haven't historically engaged with a lot of them, and I, I really wanted to see if there was a way to have some conversations in the off season with some of those shareholders, um, and we did that. And so, you know, because it was so close the previous year, I wanted to understand it going into it this year. And so we spent a lot of time over the summer and in the fall of 2012 talking to shareholders. Um, as boring as it sounds, uh, specifically about written consent and, you know, how that works in a scheme where you also have a special meetings, right. a special meetings threshold, and you have other avenues to engage like you do at Pfizer. And we talked about right. all of that and really got a lot of information going into the annual meeting about that. Was there anything frustrating about that? There, well, yeah. And um, there, there was, the, the, I guess the biggest frustration I have about the process um, that I went through this year because I talked to so many investors about written consent and also about the equity retention proposal and about pay generally. Um, on the written consent proposal, I did hear quite a bit um, that Pfizer's board's position on written consent, which is that we, you know, we do worry about it. We do have concerns about um, whether it's really needed at Pfizer, where there is a special meetings provision and there are these other ways to engage. Um, and I, I, I heard a, a significant voice saying they agree with that, but they were still going to vote for the proposal because they had to follow the recommendations. Um, and interesting. Yeah, I, thought, I think it is interesting and I think it is something that we should discuss because I really am not a fan of governance just for the sake of it. I really think you should need it. Right. And what I'm hearing at times from certain shareholders is that they don't think Pfizer or probably this implies that many companies need it, but at the same time, they're going to vote for it because they're just going to apply a consistent voting approach across the board on right, this. Right. Um, and I, I just don't know if that's the right answer. Right. You know, I do, now, I don't want to oversell this. There are many, many investors that I talk to that want written consent because they feel it's important regardless of the company, and they actually believe it's important. But some didn't, and some just were right. voting because... And, and there are also and some that said it was not. almost like a compliance uh, yeah. checklist I think that they had to... That's right. They were voting it as, as a compliance mechanism right. almost, we talked about. But. Right, so I do intend okay. in the off-season now to... to get to work and have further conversations with some of those investors. And a lot of them, again, were interested in that. You know, they, but their, their position was, right now, given where I am in the annual meeting cycle, I agree with you, but this is what my policy is. I, I really can't change the policy right now. We have too much right. going. So, you know, and I don't fault them, but I do want to have more conversations in the off season with them and with maybe some other issuers to try to understand what, what we really need out there with respect to this written consent idea, the special meetings idea, because I know lots of companies are spending a lot of time yep. talking about it. Yep. 
And that's interesting. So that so this is really your this was your issue this year. And I will say last year, based on what we talked about before we we got in here today, that was you know the Citizens United issues, yes. and you had five proposals, and you had said to me you expected even to hear some comments from shareholders on that this year, and did not get a single question. So that's interesting. Just just for the record, um, one other topic that I know that pharma companies dealt with were clawbacks, and there was a group led by I think the United Auto Workers. Did yes. you participate in that, and was it a positive, negative? Yes. Your yes, we did. Yes, positive. It was, you know, well, first, I, I think any opportunity, um, I'm going to sound like I'm sucking up right now, but I'll say it anyway. Any, any, <laughs> oppor okay. any opportunity really to sit in a room with a huge group of shareholders is a great opportunity. And yeah. so, you know, when Meredith Miller uh, approached me and she had already spoke with Doug Cha, who was also on board, um, I immediately said, of course, you know, we, we want to be in the room. Right. Um, I caveated that, though, because we already have these really robust clawbacks at Pfizer. We have clawbacks, you know, that go far beyond the, you know, the traditional material misstatement clawbacks that okay. most companies have. Right. Um, and we've had these in place for a long time. And so I didn't have a huge appetite for revisiting Pfizer's clawback structure. But I also, I, you know, but I also recognize that there's value for us to be in the room and to share lessons and things. So we did participate. We had several meetings. Some companies made changes. The the, the media coverage I've seen in the last couple months on it has Pretty been good. net positive. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I, you know, I'm obviously happy that we did it. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to move you forward to the to the actual annual meeting. And I listened to your meeting on it was webcast. Yes. Um, one interesting thing that your CEO did, which I don't know, maybe this will be in the tip phase because we're start to, we're about to run out of time. But in the tips, um, your CEO did field questions, but then referred questions to other members of his executive management team. How does that come about, and what do you think about that as a process? Um, Ian did that this year. Yes, he did it once last year too. It's you know it hadn't been done other than those instances since I've been at Pfizer, and I just think he's very comfortable with his team. Um, but it is an unusual practice, it, you think, right? I, 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 yeah. Well, I don't know if it's unusual. I think there are probably, there are probably other CEOs that do it. I'm not familiar with, with others that do it regularly. Right. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a good practice because, you know, he really wants the shareholders in the room to get a very specific answer to some of these questions. And that's when he did it in r and I don't know if you yeah, recall yeah. the examples, but yeah. you know, it, it was a specific R&D question. And Ian could give a very good answer to that, but he also thinks that Michael Dalston could give a very specific answer, and of course Michael did. Right. And so I think it was, a, I think it, I think it was great. Yeah. Um, me, you know, it's a balance when you're sitting in my seat up there because you don't want to have a free-for-all you want to have some kind of an orderly annual meeting, and the CEO and the chairman controls the room. He controls right. the floor. He controls the meeting, and he needs to maintain that control. Uh, so he shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be just punting every question and having people talk to each other without some control. But I think in Ian's uh, situation, because he's so comfortable with his team and because he still has complete control, it was not an issue at all. Right. Okay. One other thing: what kind of people come to your annual meeting? Great people. <laughs> no, I mean employees, retirees, institutions, portfolio <laughs> I, managers. I know what you mean. Okay. Um, we, we're almost done, so we have a we have a, a number of Pfizer retirees right. as well as retirees from predecessor companies like Wyeth. You because know, okay. we're in New Jersey, okay. and there's a lot of that in New Jersey. Pharmacia, um, Upjohn. Um, we also have just a number of retail holders. We don't really have a lot of institutions attending the meeting. We engage with a lot of institutions leading to the annual meeting, it, it, you know, an extraordinary amount. We go, you know, top 100 maybe. Right. Um, but we don't have them showing up at the meeting. So it's often just the proponents uh, or delegates of the proponents as this year um, and then retail and retirees. And I will tell the people watching, you do give Advil and ChapStick, which we is do. great, and you give a nice breakfast so you get people there that way. But I think you said this year you had 100 or so folks, which was a large group for Pfizer. This yeah. is probably typical of annual meetings. Not, not a lot of people show up um, at times unless there's a huge problem. Yeah. 
But let me ask you one final question because um, this is something I've seen too. How or does the board interact with the shareholders at all? And if so, when and how? Um, at the, you're talking about the meeting itself. At the meeting itself. Yes. And so we, we don't, you know, we obviously have, we have security there yeah. and we have a lot of security rules around our meetings. I mean, we don't have, um, we don't have um, metal detectors or anything like that, but we do make sure we know who's coming and we have some proof of ID and those kinds of things. Um, so we have a good sense for who's in the room. And, 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 and beyond that, we, we really do trust individuals to act appropriate. Um, and so we allow that kind of interaction. And it happens in the beginning. And in the beginning of the meeting, the board comes in. They come in the same door as everybody else. They go to the front. They do have a, a row. And mm -hmm. so does the ELT, the executive leadership team, right up front. Ian has them all stand and turn to face the shareholders mm -hmm. um, so that everybody knows who they are. But in the beginning, while we're getting situated, while we're getting everybody else in the room, there may be some interaction between shareholders and those individuals. And then at the end, there's always a few shareholders that you know, maybe they, maybe they want to follow up on their question. Maybe Ian specifically said to them, talk to, you know, Michael or Gino or Amy afterwards uh, about that issue. And so they'll come up and actually have that conversation with a member of the ELT. And then a lot of times they'll also come up and talk to the board and the board will just have a quick conversation with a few shareholders in the room. And they'll also always come up and talk to me and Ian. Um, and we will do that for as long as we have to, you know. It's because we want people to feel like they, they were heard, right. and you know, there's you can't just have unlimited Q and A, but there's right. you know, and so, and those are always nice conversations, and a lot of times I'll write the people, um, letters afterwards, you know, the, the great questions you raised with Ian afterwards, and we've looked into it, and this is the you know, so okay, great, it's a good process, that and the one other like tip it. I would yeah, add yeah one other people. tip we're out of time, but go ahead, one other tip in, quickly, I guess talking to others in my shoes, involve your IR people in this process in the beginning. So the one thing I didn't say earlier when we were talking about written consent and some of my frustrations is my inability to, to break through at certain institutions. Yes. Um, and so this year, more than ever, and last year I started it, but this year I really did it because of the written consent piece, is I got IR involved early because they have great relationships with some of the That's funds the that don't have these big, robust governance teams. So. Right. You know, right. I, I, I participated in some of those conversations, but I also just let our IR guys do it directly, and that was very useful. Okay, okay, so. good tips. Okay, thanks, Matt, and join us again next month. Join us again next time for Governance Minutes, brought to you by the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals and Knowledge Partner Host, Corporate Board Member, along with contributor, Thompson Reuters.